Again, let me pass on greetings to each one of you here this morning. We're so glad you're here, and if you're a guest here with us, we appreciate very much your presence, and I want you to know you're always invited to come and be with us at any time to worship God at M40 Avenue. I am privileged to introduce a guest speaker this morning, uh, Bob Rowley, who is the Senior Advancement Officer at Oklahoma Christian University, will be bringing us our message this morning. Uh, he has worked for Oklahoma Christian since 1970, uh, has been there probably when it was called Oklahoma Christian College, was it, uh, and before it reached university status. And I think this speaks well for him in the fact that he's stayed there that long and uh, done the job that he's doing. He earned his B.A. in Bible at Oklahoma Christian University and, uh, in 1970 and an M.A. in Religious Education from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in 1987. Uh, Bob is married to Lynn Hearn. Uh, we're sorry that his wife couldn't be with us here this morning, but uh, she is an, also an O.C. alumnus. Uh, serves as executive director for elementary education for Edmond Public Schools. And uh, Bob also serves as minister for uh, congregations in Fairview and Okeen, Oklahoma. I was wondering how he, you know, if it was one or the other, or if he was doing both of them at the same time. I didn't know how he could be at two places at once. And he tells me that he preaches three months at one place, and when they get tired of him, he goes over to the other and preaches three months at another place. So, uh, and he goes back, but that shows that they don't really get tired of him. But they have this arrangements with a, another man who preached in that area and has served in Iowa for uh, many years, Des Moines, and uh, Brother George Mayfield that I vaguely remember from my time down there many years ago when I was first converted in Enid, Oklahoma. But I won't take up any more time. I want to turn this over to Brother Bob Rowley. Well, I regret likewise that my wife cannot be with me, but I can assure you that she is uh, with me uh, in spirit. She always says to me, she has three things that she says to me before I leave to go anywhere uh, on a speaking engagement. She says, uh, I love you, uh, wear your seatbelt, and keep it short. <laughs> I, will not, I, will, I will not elaborate on which one of those three the emphasis is on. Uh, it's to keep it short, just to let you know. Uh, always when I get home, she asks me, did you keep it short? And so I have to try to do the best that I can so that I can honestly uh, answer her uh, uh, that question that she always throws out at me. But I am really honored to uh, be with you today. Uh, this is a very special day in the uh, history of Oklahoma Christian University in the fact that um, 16 of my Christian brothers who are either faculty or staff members at Oklahoma Christian are here in the greater Wichita area preaching today. We are in 17 churches throughout the greater Wichita area. Now that's Wichita itself and then uh, it covers as far south down as Wellington, as far north up as, as uh, Salina, and as far west as uh, Hutchinson, uh, but we are in 17 congregations, and we are thrilled to, uh, uh, to, to be in all of these great churches today. I will tell you that one of my goals this morning with my sermon is to make Willis look really good by comparison. So, uh, uh, Willis, I'm going to do you a big favor today by being the preacher uh, because they're going to love to have you back uh, next week uh, uh, after I get finished today. But I want to, uh, just very briefly, I want to invite all of you, if you have not been to the campus of Oklahoma Christian ever, or if it's been some time since you've been there, I, I hope you will take that two to three hour drive south to visit the OC campus sometime in the very near future. As we sometimes say, if a person hasn't been on our campus in the last five years, they really haven't been on the campus because we have been able to, with God's blessings and with the uh, uh, wonderful support 
of so many uh, wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ, we have been able to uh, make some rather uh, amazing changes uh, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the campus. And I think it is no wonder that the last five years have been the five highest years of enrollment in our 62-year history because we have been able to make significant improvements to the physical campus. Certainly, I want to let you know that out in the foyer there is a table, and on that table there are uh, uh, many pieces of information uh, for those who are young people who might be thinking uh, about uh, 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 their experience for uh, going to college after graduation from high school. Uh, there are materials for you. There are materials for parents. And then there are also some materials about just other facets of the university. One of the things that is out on the table is the information concerning our lectureship, the OC lectureship, which will be uh, October 7 through 9. And uh, we have some really outstanding people who are going to be coming and being a part of our lectureship. And so we would encourage you uh, to do that. We have classes for everyone, really. Uh, regardless of whatever uh, status you might find yourself in, I believe that you would find something at lectureship that you would enjoy. Uh, we have uh, uh, our uh, Ladies' Day program, and uh, Sally Shank, the husband of Dr. Carol Shank, a former faculty member of ours, but now the new president at Ohio Valley University, uh, she is going to be our keynoter for the Ladies' Day program. And then we just found out uh, literally a few days ago, uh, we always have what we call a mother-daughter banquet. And um, sometimes it's mothers and daughters, sometimes it's grandmothers and their granddaughters, uh, sometimes it's just anyone who wants, any lady who wants to attend the mother-daughter banquet. Uh, but um, uh, Sherry Cole, Coach Sherry Cole of the University of Oklahoma women's basketball team, who happens more than anything else important in the whole wide world, she's an alumnus of Oklahoma Christian. And uh, Sherry has agreed uh, to come and speak at our mother-daughter banquet and so we believe that's going to be a wonderful, wonderful event uh, because Sherry is such a great communicator and has such a um, uh, high standard of living in terms of her values. And uh, she has a message, and she presents that message in a powerful way. So I would encourage everyone uh, to uh, think about that uh, uh, possibility. The singing will be beautiful, the fellowship will be priceless, and by the way, we have a new president, and our new president has promised 70 degree weather with no wind if you come to the lectureship. Uh, now that's gonna be a hard one for him to fulfill. Uh, Dr. Mike O'Neill has served Oklahoma Christian for 10 years, and Mike has decided that uh, uh, he is um, uh, going to retire from his 10 years of uh, 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 being the, the great president of Oklahoma Christian. And it's just been announced uh, within the past three weeks uh, that John decided, John uh, has been with us for about 10 years as well. Uh, Dr. O'Neill brought John in uh, when um, he came on board as president. And now John is assuming the role of presidency, uh, the president. He is from eastern Oklahoma, but he made it a point to tell all of us that he loves the state of Kansas. As a matter of fact, John is with us uh, on this trip uh, uh, today, and um, uh, there are great and wonderful things uh, in store for Oklahoma Christian. Despite all of the changes that I've referenced in terms of physical uh, changes, some important bedrocks remain unchanged. Oklahoma Christian provides a top-notch academic experience for all of our students. But we are doing it within an environment that is soaked in Christian faith. Our students continue to take a number of Bible classes as a part of their core curriculum, and uh, we have chapel every day for our campus community. And uh, with all of our faculty and all of our staff being Christians, 
uh, our students could not have a better environment in which to grow. And so uh, we invite you to come and see us. Um, young people, if you um, haven't ever been to Oklahoma Christian, come, look at it, um, uh, think about it. Parents, grandparents, uh, think about encouraging your children and your grandchildren as it relates to uh, their educational uh, uh, welfare. Many years ago, back in the late 80s and the early 90s, uh, I was involved in numerous runs and races. And you're probably looking at me and saying, that's probably not true, but it is true. And I, uh, I didn't bring my folder with me, but I could bring pictures uh, to prove uh, that, uh, uh, that fact. As a matter of fact, uh, this past December, uh, on a cold uh, December morning, uh, December the 11th, I believe it was, uh, I made my way downtown to run in a 5K run uh, in uh, Oklahoma City. And if that wasn't enough that night, I went out to Midwest City uh, for a run that night. And so I did two in one day. My goal when I run is always threefold. Number one, my goal is to finish the race or the run. Number two is to not finish last. That's always been a real horror of mine that I would finish last. And if that day ever comes, that will be the last run that I do. And then number three, a goal is that I want to continue as best I can, even if the pace is really slow, I'm going to try to look like I'm running. Those are the goals that I have when I run. There was a president of a university in Illinois, Wheaton College, Dr. Raymond Edmond, who used to remind his students, he would say to the students often, it's always too soon to quit. It's always too soon to quit. I believe that to be excellent advice, not only for students, but I believe for all of us who are seeking to serve the Lord and who are seeking to accomplish the will of God in our lives. In the Lord's service, it's never, it's never time to slacken our efforts and to decide, well, I'm just going to quit or I'm going to give up. I'm, I'm, I'm not going any further. If you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be looking at a text of Scripture in the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 6, and I'm going to start at verse 7 and read down through verse 10 to read the entire paragraph, but there's one verse in particular that I will want us to look at. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Notice verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I believe Paul had this same idea in mind when he wrote let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I think what he was saying is it's always too soon to quit. Whenever we are tempted to do less than our best, or perhaps to quit completely, we ought to remember this passage of Scripture, this text of Scripture, and determine that we are going to continue on in the endeavor that we are in. Paul talks to all of us who are involved in some aspect of Christian duty. And he says that there is a privilege, he says there is a peril, and he says there is a promise. Very quickly, I want us to look at those three ideas. Number one, Paul, first of all, says that there is a great privilege, and the great privilege for all of us is that of doing good. That is what the Christian life, and that's what Christian service is all about. 
We remember Jesus as he was speaking to uh, some folks one day in what we commonly refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. You remember in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, Jesus said, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. I think what Jesus was trying to stress here is that we are not only believers, but we are behaviors as well. We are to be believers, but we are to behave in such a way that people see the beliefs that we are espousing uh, to the world. When I think about the life of Jesus, I think that the greatest biographical statement that could ever be laid at the feet of Jesus is the one found in the book of Acts. You remember in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 where the statement is made of Jesus our Lord, He went about doing good. When you and I are involved in good works, when we are involved in good deeds, when we are involved in helping those who are less fortunate than we, we are following in the steps of of the master. It was James who said in James chapter 1 and verse 22, do not merely, he says, listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. We uh, today need to keep in mind that any time we are serving the Lord, Whatever it is we are doing in our service to the Lord, let us understand and let us always be assured of the fact that that is the greatest privilege that can be given to us. And that privilege is that of doing good. And so, first of all, Paul speaks of a privilege doing good. But next Paul says that in addition to the privilege, sometimes privileges present perils. And so there is a peril. And the peril that he suggests to us here in verse 9 is let us not become weary. Someone has written these words, even though we get weary in the Lord's work and in life, we must never get weary of the Lord's work and of life. I like those words. We cannot, we must not allow ourselves to become weary. Now, the kind of weariness Paul is talking about here, I don't know exactly what it is. Maybe he was talking about a tired uh, body. I'm thinking that maybe what he was talking about was sometimes that weariness of mind and that weariness of heart that we all experience. One of the things that I love, one of the things that I love about young people is the fact that they have that spirit of, of, of youth, those qualities of uh, eagerness. They have that sense of wonder. They are... Uh, they are resolute. They, uh, uh, they have uh, joy. Uh, oftentimes my wife and I, when we are out at a public event and there are young people who are uh, all around us and they are, uh, you know, just weaving in and out and they're doing, and we look at each other and we say, oh, if we could just have that kind of energy again, if we could have that kind of enthusiasm in life uh, that they are enjoying um, but, you know, we can, we can do that. We need to keep reminding ourselves constantly that it is a privilege to serve the Lord. Whatever it is that you are engaged in here at the South Emporia congregation in terms of some facet of ministry within this congregation, and if you're not involved, I hope that you will... Find that, that ministry that you can engage yourselves uh, in. But whatever it is, 
I hope that you will always remember that it is a privilege to do what it is that you are doing. For in so doing, it will likely help you to not grow weary, as Paul speaks of. We need to constantly say to ourselves and remind ourselves, just think. Just think. God has chosen me to be his servant. God has looked down on me and given me the talent and the ability and the giftedness to do this, that, or the other, whatever it is uh, that we're able to do for others and for the Lord. And we ought to always give him the thanks and the gratitude for that. And so we have a privilege, that of doing good. But there is always the possibility of the peril of growing weary. But let me suggest in the third and last place that Paul doesn't leave it at that. He leaves with us a promise. And the promise that he leaves with us here in verse 9 is, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. The image that I see when I read this text is that of someone who is involved in uh, farming or uh, ranching or something uh, of that nature. If there is one group of people who knows what it means to stay on task, and to stay on the job. It is those who are involved in the farming industry. Those who farm, they prepare the soil. They sow the seed. They nurture that soil. And then they wait patiently. They wait patiently for the harvest. They oftentimes keep on keeping on. They keep plugging on even when times are difficult. I was visiting with a man yesterday. I was at an event, and uh, he lives out in far western Oklahoma, and far western Oklahoma has been hit with the drought even in greater ways than uh, so many other parts of our state. And um, uh, we were talking about, uh, I said, have you gotten much rain uh, recently? And he said, well, you know, uh, 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 well, we've gotten a little bit, but we haven't gotten very much. And then he got to describing his wheat and his grass. And, and he said, you know, I've, I've sold part of my herd. And he said, I probably should have sold it all. But I could tell, you know, he, in his heart he thought he should have, or maybe in his head he thought he should have sold all of his herd, but in his heart kept thinking, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. And that's the approach that he's taking to life. You know, the farmer has no guarantee of harvest. And yet you and I, we are guaranteed a harvest at the proper time or in due time. And let me just suggest here that we might not see the results of our labors today. We might not see the results of our labors next week. We might not see the results of our labors next month. We might not even see the results of our labors next year. But we will see them when we stand before the Lord in judgment. And so I would suggest to all of us, we must, we must keep on keeping on. I would read to you from the book of 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, Paul says um, uh, here in uh, 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 this uh, passage, he says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but, all to, but also to all 
who had longed for his appearing. It's always too soon to quit for all of us, whether we be young or whether we be a little bit older. If we keep in mind that we have the privilege of serving Christ and we believe in his promise of the harvest, we will, I think, be able to guard against that peril of weariness that he suggests here in the text. I close with one final story and then the lesson is yours. I'm sure that some of you might remember back to uh, uh, the 1992 Summer Olympics. It was in the 1992 Summer Olympics in Barcelona, Spain, that there was a young man from uh, Great Britain by the name of Derek Redmond. Uh, Derek Redman, uh, Rodman, Derek Rodman. Uh, Derek Rodman was running the 400 meter race. And I think that race will always stand out in my mind because it was during that run that Derek Rodman started. He was making progress and all of a sudden you saw him fall to the ground. He had pulled his hamstring muscle. And for those of you who maybe remember that and you witnessed that race on television, you remember that he was on the ground writhing in pain. And all of a sudden, I remember just kind of seeing something out of the peripheral view of my vision. And the next thing I know, here is a person down on the track and he's helping Gary get up. It was his father. His father picks Derek up and he puts Derek's arms around his neck and around his shoulders. And with his father's help, they continue until they cross the finish line. That was so touching. That was so touching. I almost cried watching that event take place. And I remember afterwards, as they were interviewing Derek Rodman, they said, well, what are your thoughts? What, what, how do you feel? And he said, I finished. I finished. And so my challenge and encouragement to all of us is to finish. It's always too soon to quit and that we all keep making a difference in the lives of those that we come into contact with. I pray that you not become weary and that you will continue to do good knowing that in the doing of that good you and I will reap the harvest and the harvest that we will reap that of the eternal harvest. Thank you for being such a wonderful and attentive audience this morning. As always, we give anyone and everyone that opportunity to make a response to the Lord. If this morning you are in our audience and you have yet to become a child of God, you have yet to commit your life to uh, the Father in heaven and to His Son, Jesus Christ, and we encourage you if you believe in Jesus, would you be willing to repent of your sins and come forward and confess your faith that Jesus is indeed the Son of God and then be baptized into Christ to have your sins washed away? If you have done that, but maybe you have um, had those days uh, where you have uh, said things, uh, you have done things, you know you have not lived up to that calling that the Lord has given to you to do. If you need to come and have the prayers of this wonderful congregation, people praying with you and for you, and asking the Lord to forgive you and to give you, once again, that renewal of strength and encouragement and power to live out the Christian life then we would invite you to do that 
And we would invite you to do it right now as we stand and as we sing. Would you come?